I'm Chris Richardson, and this is Not A Pipe Podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I'm very pleased to be speaking with Mark Steinberg from Concordia University in Montreal. He is an associate professor of film studies and the director of The Platform Lab, which you can find at theplatformlab.com. He's also the author of The Platform Economy, How Japan Transformed the Commercial Internet, and that's what I'm speaking with him about today. It occurred to me while reading this book that I have been using platforms my entire life as have you, I'm sure, the listeners, and we really don't think as much as we should about the power dynamic that's involved in that, about the opportunities as well as the setbacks that any and every platform will have. It's usually the content, and anyone who studies media knows that we shouldn't merely look at the content, and yet when it comes to platforms, whether that means Facebook, Instagram, or something broader, such as credit card payments, cell phone plans, or personal computers, we tend to forget that lesson, or at least it's easy to do so. But that's why I'm happy to have Mark here to answer questions about his book and provide some insights into those issues. And I'll just say to everybody, like always, Mark has graciously contributed five book recommendations on the site, tinapp.org, that I encourage you to check out, maybe buy if you're interested in reading them or look further into the authors that he's been reading. I always love to see what the authors I like are reading themselves. And so check out tinapp.org. If you're in the holiday giving mood, you can also buy me a coffee, which is a new app or platform, I should say, that uh, allows you to help support things like this podcast. And so those are very appreciated if you are so inclined. So Mark, thank you again for being on the show and for speaking to me. I suppose we should get this out of the way immediately. The platform economy, what exactly does that mean? And how did you get started in this endeavor that ended up the book? Well, I started with the problem of a, what is a platform. And in a way, the earlier book title was precisely that. So what is a platform was kind of a basic question that I was coming up against. I think of a platform as three different things. Ultimately, it could be defined so many different ways. But I think of it as hardware. A uh, second definition is something like social media. And a third definition is something like market or intermediary. And the economy part of it is really pointing to the importance of platforms for the current uh, economic paradigm. And a lot of people have called it platform capitalism. So there's a great book by Nick uh, Sneershek called Platform Capitalism. I like the term economy because it refers to, like the older term, refers to the management of the household. And in a way, the topic of this book is how platforms relate to management and how management practices kind of bring our new you know, platform capitalism or platform economy uh, into being. So I really see these management practices as happening in various places. But for me, one of the most kind of important sites to look at this is Japan and particularly developments in Japanese managerial theory or management theory in the 1990s. And then subsequently the, the mobile internet that really takes off as of 1999 in Japan and sort of happens elsewhere later, like particularly North America, Canada, you know, post iPhone and Android, but really gets started in Japan at an earlier moment. So platform economy for me means, I guess, a lot of things related to platforms or the way the current economy is increasingly axed around platform development, but also the crucial role that management plays in the transformation of our sort of e economy as well as lived relationship to the media around us. I think for Western readers, for English speaking readers, the default is to think about Silicon Valley. And you yes. mentioned, you, I mean, you have reference to Silicon Valley, but you're also, as you said, concerned with the Japanese experience and in some cases predating a lot of the things that we think of with California. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit about the differences or similarities between those the, the two countries, America and Japan, but also the mm -hmm. two sort of paradigms that they represent? Yeah, so I started this project and, you know, started looking at where uh, the term platform was being described, where it was being discussed in Silicon Valley um, and particularly YouTube, uh, Facebook, Google, were sort of the main um, sites, Twitter as well, that the term platform was being used. And it was the, the sort of analyses of the term that I could find in academia and outside of it were mostly around these firms and Silicon Valley in particular. So, you know, part of me, again, like I come from a, a Japan studies background, so I was really interested in, well, did Japan have platforms? And if so, 
what did these platforms look like and how did they differ from the Silicon Valley platforms? And part of that process was really discovering, um, as you're asking about, the differences between them, but also the sort of continuities. And so for differences, I would say the most striking difference um, that I could find is in Japan, platforms really develop around the mobile internet. And the mobile internet is really based around a, a system of payment where the uh, telecom company, your, your, you know, your Bell or your AT&T, is uh, the mediator between you and the internet. And if you want to read the news or if you want a weather report, these things are paid for and uh, on a subscription basis. So unlike the web that we experience via you know, our uh, desktop computers or laptops or whatever, the the mobile web was really constructed in Japan around a system of subscriptions and payments, and the collector of those was the telecom provider. And so the first relationship that or distinction between I think Silicon Valley and uh, Japan tends to be around this uh, a paid web versus a free web. You know, I think we see the encroachment of the Japanese model into you know our smartphones today, like what we. We subscribe to services that previously we would have accepted at things as free and, or pay for ringtones and, and pay for music downloads, you know, post, um, you know, Apple in, in particular. But I really see that as them trying to import a model of payment for services that Japan was really kind of pioneering or, or that was the sort of mainstream of the, the sort of Japanese web as it's experienced through mobile. And then a major difference, I guess, was also this around the same thing that, you know, there's a, a recent book called The Age of uh, Surveillance Capitalism that's uh, by Zuboff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea of surveillance and of kind of data collection is much more prominent in the Silicon Valley firms, whereas in Japan, there was a kind of much more conservative or, you know, a data protectionist uh, model in place where, you know, the telecom would analyze what the consumers have purchased, but it didn't necessarily share this data with any of its other companies and didn't really kind of marketize the data or depend on it uh, for its own profitability. You know, it, it mostly profited these telecoms from, you know, data collection fees, uh, bandwidth and so forth. And the, the kind of sellers or providers of this content mostly got uh, their money from subscription fees. So there was not the incentive there is in companies like Google or Facebook to uh, to mobilize uh, user data or user information for the purpose of uh, monetary gain. And so those are the, I guess, two really different uh, aspects between you know platforms in Japan where it was much more around uh, services and payment and the U.S. where it was free but you know based around data collection. Along with that, an important concept is content, or as mm -hmm. as you mentioned in the book, in Japanese, it would be contents, like plural. Yes. And so it, it seemed like, and there's that famous quote that content is king, Yes. but then it changed or it may have changed into being modeled on platforms and where content is not really as important as it might have been. Can you say mm -hmm. a little bit about the relationship between content and platforms? And ha has there been an, an emphasis shift, at least in management and business thinking or what do you think yeah absolutely so in the mid 1990s the term content is king is sort of a prominent term you know there's like some people say um it was sort of the microsoft mantra for a while and in japan too around the same time in the mid 90s the term contents it's a kind of transliteration of the term content became really popular and in fact this project started not with platform, but with contents. And I was in the mid 2000s or so, I was doing this project around the anime and anime business in Japan. And increasingly the term that came up in relation to the anime was this weird word or transliteration contents, which, you know, for is marked as a, as a, a borrowed term and as an English language term, but is always in the plural. And so part of the start of this book was really tracing, well, when, where did the term contents come from? It turns out it came from sort of the um, firms that were really hardware-based uh, companies like Fujitsu, kind of a parallel to Microsoft, looking to uh, content as a new site for growth in a kind of moment where hardware sales were sort of uh, plateauing or, mm -hmm. or slowing down. And so it was 
from the beginning really bound up with kind of an economic model and into the 2000s really becomes a site of governmental attention where the Japanese government's looking at anime, which is branded as contents kind of early on, and manga and, and video games and seeing these as a site of growth in a kind of slumping uh, economy post the burst of the bubble, which has sort of happened around 1990 in Japan, kind of a real estate speculative bubble mm -hmm. uh, that burst, you know, slightly different from uh, 2008 in the US, but similar. And so that's when contents really becomes a, a crucial point. But I came across another saying, you know, if content is king, distribution is King Kong, which I find kind of funny hmm. and also kind of apt because increasingly distribution or in a way, platforms covers that term distribution becomes the increasing site of, you know, in order to harness content or to really, let's say, to gain power in the distribution area, we need some content. So this was the idea behind like the AOL Time Warner tie up at a certain point that, you know, Time Warner, a content company ostensibly needed a, a kind of you know, internet uh, backbone in order to have that sort of distribution angle to, for the new era. And that was kind of a failure at the time, but it was also something that, you know, we see it happening now with something like Netflix, where they're both a, a platform company and a, a company that's heavily invested in, in content. And, and that's the kind of a pairing that we see, you know, successfully happening now, but was sort of envisioned in the 1990s. And in the book, I trace a kind of parallel but separate history of the development of the term contents and the popularity of that term in Japan and the term platform, which sort of has a different uh, development. But, you know, eventually they come together at particular moments in time. And one of these moments is the, you know, rise of the mobile Internet and mm -hmm. contents as an idea of this thing that you can sell, like whether it be ringtone, whether, you know, news or video game, or like sort of subscription-based gaming, or today comics and anime and so forth. I mean, power is a really important concept to think about in relation to these things. I, mm -hmm. I found it really interesting. Nintendo, for example, is an early uh, sort of case study that you mentioned where they were sort of an intermediary because, mm -hmm. yeah, game players are using Nintendo systems and getting games, but then game makers are also having to deal with Nintendo and going through a pretty, uh, sounded like a pretty serious vetting process to get their games available for Nintendo. But then today, I mean, we have YouTube and we have other platforms that seem to wield a lot of power, maybe a lot more than other platforms before. But at the same time, it seems, at least the discourse around it, is that it's freeing, right? You get to <laughs> put whatever you want online or you get to distribute your content to millions of other people. So what are the power dynamics that you think are most applicable that maybe carry on from decades earlier and maybe are new? What should we be looking out for if we're concerned with uh, thinking about power in these kinds of relationships? It's a fantastic question. I guess one of the things I alluded to earlier was a kind of theory of the platform as intermediary, which you mentioned right now. And I guess it's worth saying like there's this kind of comes more from economics and is now becoming more popular within media studies. But at the time I started this book, it wasn't so integral. But it is an idea that anything that acts as an intermediary between two or more parties can be called a platform. So one of the you know examples that's often given is a credit card company mm -hmm. is ultimately a platform that connects uh, vendors of uh, services like a restaurant um, and and buyers of those services like you and I who go into a restaurant and want to pay for our meal and in between there's a credit card company that facilitates the payment companies like Nintendo acted as this sort of intermediary between the you know producers of games and the buyers of games or consumers and their position of power really came in acting as a kind of uh, arbiter of who gets to put their games on the Nintendo platform. And as you're, you know, sort of alluding to, they had this thing called a Loco chip that forbade uh, kind of unauthorized uses of or unauthorized production of, of content for Nintendo systems. So that was a really kind of hardware lockdown mode of arbitrating content, which content gets to be played. Mm -hmm. um, and YouTube, in a way, started with this the rhetoric of platform and, and embraced the rhetoric of platform so heartily because it provided them a certain amount of cover against particularly copyright infringement mm -hmm. uh, lawsuits that were brought in the 2000s. And this is something that Tarleton Gillespie covers in a great piece called The Politics of Platforms, 
that is one of the really early and crucial uh, critical pieces on platforms and kind of within the realm of platform studies, where he tracks the way platform essentially implies an open, free, you know, uh, unmediated kind of uh, site where you could load, put up whatever content you like and have that sort of freedom that you're talking about. And I think at the time it was serving YouTube's purpose to call themselves platform because it protected them from the lawsuits in terms Viacom, I think, had, you know, a massive lawsuit that, you know, YouTube was facilitating uh, piracy. YouTube countered that it was just a platform. And to some degree, that that argument that they're just a platform was embraced by the public, but I think is increasingly also coming under attack by the public or is what, like, you know, it's coming under attack by academics, obviously, but also by a wider public that doesn't sort of want to give them the social license to just have kind of Nazi videos, you know, circulating online and so forth. And so there is going to be an increased attention to how they moderate the content. And so ultimately there's, you know, from being a kind of wild west of content and YouTube is circulating back to what might be more like the Nintendo model of never, it'll it'll never be as strict as Nintendo, but to actually uh, have some responsibility for what they put out on their platform, whereas before they didn't have to really take responsibility for it. And in fact, uh, Charlton Gillespie's newest book is about content moderation on YouTube. So these kinds of practices, I think, are increasingly going to be subject to a lot of scholarly attention, but also public attention. Yeah, I mean, uh, also Facebook fits into that very nicely with the 2016 election mm-hmm. as a platform in that sense, as a sort of mediator between people who wanted to advertise to consumers and consumers who wanted to use the the Facebook app for whatever it is they're doing and they mm-hmm. happen to get ads too. Facebook was very laissez-faire, it sounded like, but then later with the backlash about especially sort of propaganda appearing during that time, they've, yeah. now, they've now changed. And so do you think that that's where everything is going? Do you think that um, that we're going to see much more I guess hands-on mediation, in a sense, from these from these corporate entities, and if so, does that involve a power shift? I think so, and you know, it's in this case, power cuts both ways. I'm happy to see them intervening more heavily into what gets put online and and what doesn't. And mm-hmm. you know, I think this is something that they were able to shirk responsibility for by calling themselves platforms and are now increasingly taking responsibility for. And I think generally, this is a good thing. And if you're a fervent believer in free speech, this will bother you. But, you know, I I think that to some degree we have to regulate what speech is allowed and what is not. And, you know, same thing in Japan as well. There's a sort of degree of social license that was taken with platforms at first, but they have tended to kind of move back towards some sort of middle ground between uh, moderating what is said and the sort of earlier, you know, kind of embrace of internet freedoms and sort of libertarian ideology that, you know, has been called the California ideology and so forth that believes in internet should be a space of, you know, ultimate freedom and expression and so forth. But that to go back to what you said, that the power in a way will will cut both ways that the regulatory bodies will look at Facebook and YouTube uh, with more concern after the 2016 election. And, you know, there's talk about breaking Facebook up and platforms are also then subject to sort of governmental intervention in a way that they weren't, at least the threat wasn't even there until this point. So the platforms may have more power over its users, but that also in doing so, I think there's like a degree of hopefully civility and public discourse will also return. Yeah, I mean, there's lots to cover in that. I want to ask you a question about how you situate yourself in sort of academic disciplines, because it's Mm -hmm. interesting to me, you're in film studies at Concordia University, you're doing international uh, studies of Japan and America and and North America. Mm -hmm. And you're also deeply involved, at least based on this book, in sort of management theory and economics and other other disciplines, many of which don't often talk to one another. So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about how you situate yourself as an academic, but also your research, because it seems like you really are in conversation with a lot of different groups that often are siloed. Yeah, no, and I kind of agree. So in a, I started this research in part, it comes out of my earlier book, which is called Anime's Media Mix. And that was a book that really said, well, you know, anime 
has been approached and it had been approached at that time as a, an art form or as a, a form of animation, but hadn't really been discussed in relation to kind of the merchandising strategies were really essential to that. And, you know, anyone who looks at Pokemon or something can tell that there's a massive amount of sort of uh, marketing strategies, merchandising and so on mm. that go along with that. So and I had the chance to publish that book in Japanese. And in doing so, I was also going around to this particular company, Kadokawa, that I had done a lot of work on uh, for that first book and interviewed the uh, CEO of the company and the the now chairman of the company and asked him sort of about his what are called media mix strategies at the time. And he would kept talking about platforms. And so in a way, I was brought into the path of studying platforms in part through encounters like that, that sort of put me onto the importance of platform, not just as, as a keyword in media studies where, you know, I do my work, but also increasingly as a a corporate byword or a kind of uh, management strategy that's thought about at the sort of upper levels of particular companies I was interested in. So I came to it via kind of an industry studies approach to animation that brought me to a kind of wider study of the Japanese corporate environment. And that in turn kind of keyed me to particular uh, managerial uses of the term platform, whereas before I think I had thought of platform really in the context of media studies where we talk about, let's say, you know, hardware platforms or we use the term game gaming platforms fairly frequently, social media platforms. But platform in the sense of a, a kind of intermediary or a transactional space, that was kind of new and, and something that I got keyed into via talking to some of the you know corporate managers at these Japanese companies that I was interested in. Uh, it also happened that I was kind of friends of a friend of uh, an economist who keyed me into uh, debates in economics around the term platform, where that kind of uh, managerial sense of credit card is a platform comes from. So, you know, it's in part even tracing this strange word platform that was, you know, a means or a kind of a a way, a vehicle for bringing me to the multiple places and ways it it had been used. And having a certain amount of, I guess, freedom in what I work on myself uh, allowed me to sort of follow those leads and take me to, you know, uh, from video game studies to economics to management studies, it's, you know, fields that I hadn't really engaged in in previous research, but were sites of this kind of platform theorization. So it's a kind of roundabout way of saying, so I come from a kind of film media studies perspective, but my investment in how these film and media are addressed from a kind of managerial perspective led me to other places in which the term platform is used. And and that in turn led me to cross over from economics to management to sort of platform studies to, you know, even policy studies of, of platforms in a way that resulted in this book, which may be kind of a disciplinary hodgepodge, but hopefully also sums up a lot of the key thinking around platforms today. I think disciplinary hodgepodge is can be really valuable because uh, they don't limit the perspective and therefore mm-hmm. they can uh, outline and highlight a lot of a lot of other things that might get missed if you were just thinking about film or just thinking about a certain managerial technique, for example. Yeah. That kind of leads me into my next question, which is early on and at the conclusion of your book, you kind of build on Lazzarato's idea of the modes of production and the modes of capitalism affecting yeah. Uh, Le Monde or the worlds that yeah. are created through it. And you say that capitalism and language cooperate in the production of worlds slash words because they they do both, right? And um, mm-hmm. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about that because I think as, as you started to say already, the creation and the use of platform as a word and as a concept that could be applied to various things resulted in very uh, distinct practices that would arguably look quite different if they were conceived as not platforms but as some other mode. And so how, how do words or how does language and discourse and how does the material practices that you're studying, uh, how do they fit together or how do they maybe not fit together so well? Yeah, it's a tough question. In a way, I've often struggled with what's the relationship between words and worlds or the kind of words that we use and and the impact that they have on the world around us. And so I sort of wanted to foreground that in this book where the first half is really about uh, the word and their kind of their sites where we find this term, especially platform, but also the word content. And the sites where we see the unfolding of these terms and the kind of conceptual paradigms around them in, say, uh, management theory and also the the kind of internet culture of 
Japan first and foremost, but to some degree, Japan and Silicon Valley. And I think to some degree, they are words, like in the case of YouTube that I talked about earlier, they are, uh, you know, convenient ways of getting a- around problems or away from problems. They're sometimes just fancy packaging for old ideas or old practices. You know, and before we talked about before we talked about platforms, we were, t- we were using the term media more often. So, what was n- media has now become platform and seems to be rebranded, and that itself, like in a way, lends value to certain corporate practices. And so, one of my anchor points for the book, and I talk about it in the intro, I talk about it at later points, was a particular merger between two companies, one of which was a publishing company called Kadokawa. And they were a kind of publishing company and media conglomerate. Mm. And the other was Nico Nico Video, which is essentially a kind of YouTube uh, of Japan. At a certain point in 2015, they announced a merger and they described their merger as a merger between contents and platforms. And so this merger itself, which in some degrees is a is a reprise of the AOL Time Warner merger that we saw in, in the US in I believe 99, uh, 2000. This is really a kind of a reboot of that content platform collaboration, but also a kind of rebranding of it in these terms, that content and platform. And I think these terms became a, a way of explaining what they're doing, but also a way of projecting greater value or, you know, increasing the stock price of this firm as it as it merged and sort of becoming, you know, placing themselves at the cutting edge at a moment when the book industry is in, in sort of decline, the printing industry is in some decline, not as, you know, uh, as is sort of happening all around the world. And platform seems like a kind of a savior term at that moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, you know, that's one example of the term being mobilized as a keyword, but also as a kind of economic paradigm where they gain stock value by adding this uh, keyword to their their sort of uh, description of their company. Um, and so it's a, also a moment when, you know, uh, kind of uh, business practice intersects with keyword popularity. And, th- you know, there are other examples of this, but this is one of the sort of paradigmatic examples where the worlds and words come together and impact each other. Yeah. And I mean, along with the study or the increased understanding and usage of platform, at least in scholarship, comes concepts of platform capitalism, as I believe you mentioned earlier, also platform imperialism. Mm -hmm. And you, of course, chose platform economy, as you said. I know you, you specifically say that you have kind of in this book, at least, avoided making predictions of the future about where things are going, because that's probably it's probably a wise move because things are changing so rapidly and things can get dated very quickly when they start talking about the future. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not asking you to predict the future, Mm -hmm. but I would like to know what you think people, scholars and consumers should pay attention to when, when we're thinking about platforms. Like I would assume that platforms, as you say, and content won't disappear. Like these words will continue to circulate, but I, I feel like they're almost guaranteed to change or to perhaps venture in directions that they, they didn't originally. So what do you think scholars, consumers, or, or management, or what have you, what should they be paying attention to as things go forward? To return to one thing, a term you uh, brought up, platform imperialism, it's one of the terms that I uh, grapple with in the book. In a way, the the simple answer to what to your great question is the continuing power of platforms in our lives as platforms as mediators for culture. And I think this is where I find myself most concerned about the power of platforms is how they transform cultural production today. And the term platform imperialism is a sort of useful term to grasp part of the problem, which is you know, the increasing power of Silicon Valley firms around the world in mediating uh, cultural production. And another of the the sort of issues that I grappled with towards the beginning of the project never really went away is, you know, what does it mean that Netflix is one of the not main means, but at least one of the increasingly important means that Japanese, say, consumers gain, gain access to content? So what does it mean that Japanese, let's say, television is mediated through and accessible through an American company like Netflix or American transnational. So the term uh, platform imperialism kind of points at the 
earlier moment of when we talked about cultural imperialism and the way, let's say, Hollywood film and American fast food culture were transforming the world around us. Um, and the world around us, I mean, sort of, you know, the global consumption patterns, you know, global uh, cultures through their sort of powers of distribution or their their popularity. And I think this is something that was critiqued for being too unilateral. It wasn't simply that people in Brazil were forced to watch American films. People in Brazil wanted to watch American films and watch them in a different way than, you know, say, they the, the sort of cultural imperialism hypothesis posits. But still, this term platform imperialism does point to the kind of political economic problem of uh, U.S., predominantly U.S.-based platforms having an unreasonably large role in global cultural uh, production and consumption today. And so I think this is where I would say into the future, it's this problem is not going to go away. They may call themselves something else for sure. Like the, the term platform is, is a kind of a keyword and is a word right now, but it, it may dissolve into something else. But the power of what we now call platforms in mediating cultural production will continue. And I think this is what we have to increasingly pay attention to. And, you know, there's been increasingly interesting work done around the, the concept of what's been called the platformization of cultural production, a kind of a mouthful in and of itself, but how platforms transform the way culture is produced. And to that, we can say which culture is produced and how and where. And these are issues that I think in a more granular way, people as consumers, as scholars, as you know, concern publics, uh, we should be conscious of and think about moving forward. At the same time, related to that discourse is the idea of globalization and sort of liquid borders that can be can be basically erased in some cases with um, international corporations and international technologies that don't don't really don't really recognize certain borders. But at the same time, nationalism has uh, sprouted up in a lot of different countries, and it seems that on some level borders are tighter than they ever have been, or at least in some places. How much do you think in terms of platforms and in terms of global media, are nations or nation states an important element of the of the situation and that should be studied? And how much are they maybe disappearing in certain ways? I mean, it's interesting you talk about how one of the earlier Japanese companies using cell phones that wanted to go global didn't really succeed. But later on, it seems that Apple and Google did, in many ways, succeed in going global, although they're not really in China, not the way that they would probably like to be. So mm -hmm. how, how much do borders and nation states play a role in your consideration and, and continued consideration of platforms? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. So, it, you know, China is a great example and an interesting example of how protectionism can foster uh, their own sort of national uh, platforms that then become competitive on a world stage. And I have to say that as a, you know, part of the other background of this project was seeing the decline of BlackBerry in the, you know, later uh -huh. 2000s or early 20 teens. Um, and, you know, I was never a huge BlackBerry user, but as a Canadian, you know, it was sort of almost a, a nationalist pride in, in BlackBerry. So seeing that decline is also the decline of a particular kind of country variant or national variant on technologies and technological infrastructures. And I think the rise of nationalism has not necessarily been accompanied by a rise of, let's say, call it techno-nationalism, where com countries becoming protectionistic of their internet spaces. You know, that it, it seems like a nat natural corollary, but that, you know, some of the American companies operate as freely as they used to, even in amidst the sort of rise of a, of a kind of nationalist sentiment around the world. That said, China's interesting example, uh, and countries in East Asia, which I'm most familiar with, like Korea and Japan and China, each have their own dominant, uh, for example, chat apps that are the dominant also social media platform. So in Japan, it's Line, which we don't really use much here, but is a huge chat app in Japan. Mm -hmm. yeah, China's WeChat um, and Korea's Talk, and each of them have uh, kind of dominant market share, and they've gained a kind of cultural presence that hasn't in, impacted, let's say, on uh, YouTube in the case of Japan or, or Korea, but nonetheless offers a kind of space for a cultural difference to uh, emerge. And I think this is the possibility, at least, of national-based platform model. 
But at the same time, I'm wary of just celebrating uh, national platforms for the very dangers that, you know, the sort of nationalism that you talk about can be linked with a sort of techno nationalism. So I guess I'd like to see more diverse platforms or more a number, a greater number of platforms uh, develop and be fostered, you know, requires a certain amount of protectionism by countries, then I am not necessarily adverse to it. But I do worry about then, are they going to be co-opted for the nationalisms that are, you know, much more destructive, you know, sort of xenophobic. And so, mm-hmm. um, and I think those are not necessary corollaries, but they could, they could merge. And for me, this, the story that I tell in the book is really a story of, at one point, something that was really a, a national platform, iMode or, uh, you know, Docomo, becomes taken over by this global dominance of uh, Android and iOS or Apple and Google. So this is a transition from a nation-based model of sort of technological infrastructure to a much more sort of global model of not only technological infrastructure, but in a way, you know, cultural infrastructure of everyday life. And so what happens uh, from now on is a sort of open question whether we're going to, with the rise of a kind of economic protectionism, whether we're also going to have a kind of technological protectionism, maybe, maybe not. And, you know, I, I'm kind of curious, but I do think that thinking about the relationship between culture and if culture is allied to nation, sometimes too easily, maybe nation as well. And platforms is an important topic of concern. As the question changes, at least in my head, after reading your book from one primarily of content to one primarily of platform, a lot of the um, stories that we tend to hear are, you know, like YouTube stars or what have you, like iTunes successes and people who are able to upload videos get seen by millions of people perhaps make hundreds of thousands of dollars in advertising or or clicks and stuff like that and it seems mm-hmm. it seems really sort of liberating for people who want to i don't know create films of their own or music of their own and and that kind of thing because i mean that's very much how they're sold as um uh, something like YouTube, right? You could be the next YouTube star. It's pretty much free mm-hmm. to put your stuff up there and you can start getting paid as long as you get 10,000 clicks to start with or what have you. Mm-hmm. But I'm thinking also if platforms are the thing to consider, it seems very hard or I, I can't even imagine like nothing comes to mind when I think about stories of the next YouTube. Like it seems like YouTube is mm-hmm. in, in our consciousness and our cultural consciousness sort of fixed And then the question is, can you get on YouTube? And if so, how can you get on YouTube and be successful? But if platforms really are the the key element of a lot of this discussion, then can you be the next YouTube seems to be an appropriate question, but one that's a lot harder to ask. I mean, is there going to be a next YouTube or a next platform? Or is it so hard to enter as a new platform that really it's it's just almost an impossible venture that way? while it's an easier venture to be one of the contents which are not as as crucial to this dynamic. Looking at the term platform from a kind of historic angle, which I did in the book, led me to see that with time, platforms also change. So the dominance of, you know, in a kind of total dominance of iMode in the early 2000s is now kind of distant memory, even mm-hmm. in Japan. But it also serves as a reminder that something that is a dominant platform can, in the next decade, become a platform has been. So in that sense, I don't think it's impossible to think of YouTube as disappearing. That said, it's also hard to imagine it disappearing or becoming that much less important. And I think as platforms gain power, and, and you know, Facebook's another one of these, they, you know, they gain a kind of market dominance and a kind of uh, through what's called network so the more people who use it, the more valuable it is, gain a sense of permanence and inevitability that makes it harder to even consider becoming the next platform, as you're saying exactly. Like who thinks that I'm going to make the next YouTube when YouTube is such an established and and kind of powerful platform? The only other thing I could think, though, is that, for instance, Twitch, which now is owned by Amazon, of course, but Twitch is a different kind of platform that is also used. And of course, YouTube may compete with it, but for kind of live streaming uh, gameplay, Twitch is the dominant platform. So it's not inconceivable that other platforms emerge and become dominant in different fields that are kind of yet to be isolated or yet to be seen. And let's say South Korea, there's a 
uh, Africa TV, which is a, pro a platform that's really used for streaming uh, live eating or live streaming eating, and um, or mukbang it's called. So there there are places for different types of content to take up different types of platforms, and and this is this is sort of still a kind of an open possibility. I think one that we have to take really seriously. And I think even dominant platforms like Facebook are to some degree always on the defensive. And that's nice to see because it means that they also view their own existence as not inevitable. And I think it's best to, for us to think about the power platform, dominant platforms wield and be critical of that, but also have a kind of almost a utopian view that other platforms are possible. Yeah, I mean, along with that, Facebook is an inter interesting case for me because when I first started teaching in my tenure track position, I often did classes or I had connected people from class on Facebook because everybody was on Facebook. Yeah. Today, very few of my students use Facebook and uh, they definitely don't use it the way that they did even five years ago. I mean, seeing that change makes me think that Facebook as a as a social web platform I think is inevitably personally I think is inevitably going to go away. I don't think mm -hmm. I don't think Facebook is the place that people are going to connect like they might have earlier in in the decade. At the same time though, I think that the next thing whatever that is may easily be purchased by Facebook yes. and yes. therefore yeah, it's going to be the corporation itself is going is maybe going to last. I don't think the website facebook.com Personally, mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to last. But Facebook, when it was originally created, arguably, I mean, there are obviously nuances, but it kind of came from nothing, created mm -hmm. a huge multi-billion dollar dynasty. And now even though the actual thing that made it rich to begin with might disappear, it doesn't seem likely to disappear anytime soon because it's, you know, it's buying up other properties. It's thinking about AI and, and virtual gaming and all of this kind of stuff. So in that sense, is there going to be the same opportunity, you think, for creating new things like the next Facebook? Or will the next Facebook be bought by the old Facebook? Is that yeah. a more likely scenario? Yeah, definitely. It does seem like that at this point. And this is the place where I think government regulation and intervention could be really powerful. And, you know, now Facebook's earlier purchases of Instagram um, and mm -hmm. WhatsApp are being scrutinized. And if they happen today, maybe they wouldn't have happened or maybe they would. But in a couple of years, maybe they would not. And this is where I think the, you know, government intervention in, in kind of creating the regulatory conditions that prevent that kind of incumbent from owning the whole the future essentially can be powerful and important and i agree with you that it seems at this particular moment that the next facebook could be bought by facebook and will be but it's also a potential turning point where governments and especially the european union are becoming more uh, mm -hmm. proactive against the kind of massive accumulation those sort of robber barons type effect that we are witnessing in the sort of digital environment today and the more facebook's there are the better for all of us because they provide you know because platforms are not just um, transparent media they're also so uh, ways of shaping content. And, you know, this is the other takeaway of the book, that there's a profound interrelationship between types of content and types of platforms. And ultimately, platforms are sort of cultural producers and, and shapers of culture. So the more platforms we have, the more sort of cultural diversity we have, ultimately. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much to think about after uh, reading your book. I'm curious, Mark, where you want to go uh, next in your research, like if you're going to continue this in certain directions, or perhaps move on to a new project altogether, where, where are you going from here? Yeah, well, I have a couple of projects under development. One is a specific study of the platform chat app line that I mentioned, um, and that looks at much more the sticker production. So there's, uh, you know, one of the dominant things that the platform sells are stickers, and there's the whole creators market, that sort of amateur production of stickers, but they're not exactly amateurs, they're actually sort of micro entrepreneurs. So the sort of entrepreneurial production of stickers is one thing I'm interested in. I'm also, this much more comes out of the platform project, interested in looking at the concept of convenience more seriously because, you know, there have been a lot of critiques of the platform gathering of data 
and the sort of power of platforms, but the the endurance of platforms and the sort of hold they have on each and every one of us who uses platforms in our everyday lives is, I think, really tied to the ease of use and the sort of accessibility or the, the simplifying of particular tasks that platform offers us. And so the lure of a platform is in its convenience. And so I think we really need to integrate or interrogate this concept of um, convenience and how it's operating in the platform economy today. So that's something, you know, in the in the book, I treat much more the sort of managerial viewpoint on mm-hmm. platforms. After that, I'd like to treat more like the user perspective and the concept of convenience as a as a kind of point of, you know, understanding why we use platforms, but also a potential uh, site of critique of platforms themselves. Yeah, that's a, that sounds really interesting. I mean, I want to thank you for speaking to me today about the book. It's kind of insane for me that platforms and the things that you discuss, they're in front of us, pretty much all of us, definitely anyone listening to this podcast. And yet they're rendered invisible most of the time, or at least thinking through it in that way is rendered invisible. And so it's a really important work. And I really appreciate you talking more about it with me today. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate your your amazing questions. And thank you for uh, having me here. Thank you very much for listening to This Is Not A Pipe podcast. I couldn't be happier with the responses I've been receiving, whether that's for book recommendations for the podcast or for my own reading or comments on how to potentially improve or circulate the podcast in better ways. And so please keep that feedback coming. Also, send some coffees on the Buy Me A Coffee platform if you're inclined to be generous in this holiday season. I really do appreciate all of the listeners and all of the feedback, as well as all of the positive reviews. Those are always helpful and help motivate me when I'm uh, crazy busy, as I'm sure a lot of you are as well. And so, thank you. Until next time, I'm Chris Richardson. Cheers. Cheers.